Composer John Cage is one of those people whose work you either love or you hate. Cage pioneered a musical form that he calls chance operations. That's the random groupings of words, music, and everyday sounds. I'm Mehdi Mutante, and I just finished a project I'd like to tell you about. I spent part of 2023 producing a new realization of John Cage's classic 1953 tape music piece, Williams Mix. The score is 192 pages long, there are 8 channels of sound using about 600 audio samples, and more than 10,000 tape splices. This is the first time since the original version 70 years ago that someone has done this piece for magnetic tape, as written. I'll talk more about that later, but first, let's listen to what it sounds like.
Yep, that's William's mix. So, what's the background of this piece, and how did they make a version in 2023? John Cage was born in 1912 in Los Angeles and died in 1992 in New York City, by which time he had become one of the most famous composers of the 20th century. He produced many interesting experiments and writings in his life, but in 1951 he initiated the so-called Project for Magnetic Tape, which was a concerted effort by Cage and some of his associates to make pure tape music. So over here, Mr. Cage has a tape recording machine, which will provide much of the... Will you touch the machine so we can know where it is? The technology of recording on tape was blossoming in the early 50s, but it was still an expensive medium, and no one had focused on making music with the tape as the very material of composition. To fund this project, Cage received a $5,000 grant from his personal friend, the architect Paul Williams, and named the resulting composition in his honor. The piece was originally planned for 20 minutes, but the logistics and manual labor required to produce the first movement of only about four minutes scuttled that idea. Cage kept a very detailed score, 192 pages in total, and that is now held at the New York Public Library in the John Cage Music Manuscript Collection. As you can see in this time-lapse video, I'm cutting fragments of tape to match the exact shapes as shown in Cage's score, and then reassembling those fragments with a non-magnetic splicing tape. I used blank leader tape for the portions of score that don't have any audio. He likened the score and this process to a dressmaker's pattern. You just have to cut the correct sound into the correct shapes and assemble. Now, just do that about 12,000 times. Let's find the start of the last note. There it is. I'll cut the tape there. Put it back, ready to join up. The possibilities of doctoring natural sound became an obsession. With the new tape, and nothing more than a razor blade, new areas of musical creativity became possible. When I first started working on this project in 2020, the only real-to-reel -real machine I had was this, a Fuji a Fuji Quarter FL55, built in Japan in 1955. I actually had a few at the time because I was experimenting with tape loops and they were relatively cheap on eBay. Uh, they should have a metal panel here. The machine is vacuum tube based so it gets pretty hot after a few hours of being on. It's also from the 1950s in monaural, so pretty close to the tube based monaural equipment uh, used on the original. Uh, unfortunately the fastest speed it can play back tape is uh, 7.5 inches per second, which is uh, half the rate called for in Cage's score, but I will go into that in a second. Some of the shapes in the score are so complex that it requires numerous cuts, not just a single pass of the razor blade, and the tape, uh, both the magnetic and the sticky splicing tape, can end up about three or four layers deep. I streamed this whole process on Twitch, and the footage you're seeing is a 24x time lapse of those streams. In all, I spent about 100 hours splicing tape. I've uploaded the full time lapse to my YouTube channel, if you want to see it in its entirety. Um, it's hard to estimate, but in the two years leading up to splicing, I probably spent an additional 200, 250 hours um, sourcing sounds, uh, printing them to tape, looping, electronic mixing, and processing variations, and all the other stuff I needed to do just to get ready for the splice assembly. There are about 600 different sounds and just about as many manipulated and processed variants. So let's say about 300 hours of work in all to make a piece that's just over four minutes of final runtime. The original version in 1952 took a team of 13 people over a year to do, um, and I fully understand why now. They were also working on other projects, composing, practicing other pieces, and leading social lives in mid-century Manhattan art scene. I worked uh, full-time for two months with no other projects to assemble this before the end of 2023. Let's look at the score again, and I'll tell you more about the sounds Cage calls for in this piece. There are eight channels of sound that are intended to be played back simultaneously. Each of these channels can have one to two uh, sounds playing, so it's possible that there may be anywhere from zero to 16 sounds playing at the same time between all the channels. Cage calls for six categories of sound. City, country, electronic, manual, wind, small sounds that require amplification. Certain sounds could fit under multiple categories, but Cage leaves interpretation open in such cases. For instance, um, a traffic cop's whistle could easily be a city sound or a wind sound, 
Likewise, a wind rustling in trees could be a wind sound, a country sound, or even a small sound that requires amplification. I think this taxonomy is probably influenced by Luigi Russolo's grouping of sounds in the Art of Noise Manifesto from 1913. There are some differences, but six groupings of sounds uh, typically considered non-musical that the composer draws from, and uh, literally draws from as Cage created a deck of cards for his sound library. Uh, he used chance operations like the I Ching or rolling six-sided dice and then would select which sound would appear. Uh, the processing, shape, and length of which is also determined by chance operations like coin flips. I could either go in the direction of intention, as everyone else was going, or I could explore the avenue that no one else was exploring, the absence of intention. Since those two sounds, which I was making, I did not intend to make. There's a mathematical structure underlying the whole piece. It provides a framework so that the complete piece isn't actually as random as it may appear. Uh, if you're interested more in the framework or the indeterminacy that Cage employed, he wrote about it at length in a letter to Pierre Boulet in 1952, and also later in his life in books and interviews. Uh, suffice to say, others have written more uh, than I'll go into in this short video. The Barons, uh, Louis and Bibi, who uh, became infamous for their cybernetic influenced electronic soundtrack to the Forbidden Planet, were employed as engineers on this project to record and collect sounds on their two tape machines. Cage also gave the Barons some sound effects records, um, which they dubbed tape. So I don't think all the country and city sounds are actually collected as field recordings. Um, for instance, I think the frog croaks that pop up repeatedly through the original come off a sound library record, as um, Bibi later recalled that their equipment at the time just really was not portable. Looking back at the score again, you'll notice that after the sound type, um, A, B, C, etc., there are an additional three letters, either C or V. These stand for controlled or variable, and connote if the sound should have parameters of frequency, timbre, and volume that are either predictable or unpredictable. You can see quickly um, how many permutations of the sound library you draw from is really needed. Uh, Cage said he used about 600 different sounds. Uh, some of those may only appear once or twice and would be removed from the deck. Others make repeated appearances in the piece, um, such as that frog croak I mentioned. The score also calls for looping and electronic processing of some sounds to create um, rhythms and variations. The sound sculpting tools that the Barons had in their private studio in 1952 would have likely been a uh, ring modulator, spring reverb, tube mixers and amplifiers, and uh, the tape machine had a variable speed playback so they could dub slower or faster versions of their sounds. Um, for my work, I tried to stick pretty closely to that, uh, but I also employed a Bode uh, frequency shifter, a uh, tape echo, and some vintage 90s Macintosh software. So once these sounds had been collected and processed by the Barons and the score written, Cage, uh, David Tudor, and Earl Brown, with occasional assistance from others, began the arduous task of assembling the eight tape channels. Uh, Brown recollected later that he probably did the bulk of the work, as the others found it too boring or were too busy with other commitments. Cage's idea of using multiple channels on distributed loudspeakers is probably influenced by Antonin Artaud's uh, staging of La Sensi from 1935, in which Artaud had recorded sound effects played back from four loudspeakers distributed in the theater. When William's mix was publicly debuted, it was played back on eight uh, monaural tape machines fed to eight loudspeakers placed around the auditorium. Because the sounds on the channels were pulled from a deck by chance operation, there's really no uh, intentional correlation of sounds in the final piece. Synchronized playback of the channels was also basically impossible with the tape machines of that era. Uh, Simpty was about 20 years away at this point, so that was never intended. Uh, consequently, you won't ever hear a sustained sound move around the sound space between speakers. Um, I did add some spatialization effects to my binaural and ambisonics mixes of this piece, but the sounds are so short and granular that even intentional spatialization honestly isn't very effective. It's like a pointillist effect with sparks of sound like showering around you, but no sustained impression of movement. The official premiere of Williams' mix was March 22, 1953, as part of an evening that Cage programmed of music for magnetic tape at the uh, Festival of Contemporary Arts in the University of Illinois in Urbana. Uh, unfortunately, I can't find any photos of that premiere, but the student newspaper The Daily Ally and I uh, wrote a pretty scathing review of the premiere that also included works by the Barons, Earl Brown, Pierre Henri, and others. Uh, Cage later sent Boulay dubs of the tape, 
and also traveled to play it in Germany at symposiums of new music. Also in 1953, uh, Cage moved out of New York City to help found a rural artist co-op about 40 miles north of Greenwich Village outside Stony Point, New York. Uh, actually, he moved into a house that he built and shared with Paul Williams and his wife, Vera. Uh, Cage's partner, Merce Cunningham, stayed in New York. Uh, Cage said that during this period, he felt less and less interested in music and was also less interested in composing as he uh, had become disconnected from telling other people what to do. Uh, one has to wonder if the grueling work on Williams' mix had anything to do with this. Williams' mix also seems to have been received by the public with a resounding thud, not recognized as a watershed moment at the time by his peers or the public, and with indifference or dismissal by later critics. In 1958, Cage had a retrospective of his career at the town hall. Uh, at this concert, Williams' mix was played back, I believe as a stereo mix down on two loudspeakers on stage instead of um, the eight speakers. This playback, however, was re-recorded off the loudspeakers and uh, pressed to vinyl. Um, complete with audience noise. Uh, to my ears, the uh, applause at the end of the track sounds like like canned sound effect applause. But uh, regardless, this is how the recorded or fixed version of Williams' mix entered the public listening experience. Cage was definitely not a fan of records. I don't myself use records. And I give the example of someone who lives happily without records. But I notice that no one pays any attention to you or maybe a few pay attention, but most people use records. Well, it's useful to hear music that, from concerts or performances it's really that not, I get to. No, it's really not useful at all. Well, that, uh, it, it, it merely destroys one's, one's need for, for real music. It, it substitutes artificial music for real music, and it, and it makes people think that they're be engaging in a musical activity when they're, when they're actually not. And it has completely distorted and turned upside down uh, the function of music in, in anyone's experience. Mm. In another interview, Cage was asked about the success of his experiments, and he said that it would be silly to disown any older works, but that he also only chose to keep performing works that he thought had been successful or that maintained his interest. The fact that 1958 was the last year he played Williams' mix back would seem to indicate that he didn't feel it was particularly successful. This is probably down to the like, truly grueling nature of the assembly um, versus the effect that's obtained by the final piece. It doesn't seem like a good use of time. Uh, it took a year, a whole team, thousands of dollars of financial support to make up essentially a four minute piece that sounds like radios being tuned between channels with some random bursts of noise and sound effects. Personally, I had fun making this. Um, I don't really get bored doing repetitive manual tasks like this. Um, I think my final version sounds like Williams Mix while using some sounds that I think are interesting or amusing. I'm a little reluctant to talk about the samples I used. I did pull from the entire history and breadth of recorded media, the internet, field recordings, etc., etc. Keying in on samples isn't really the point, but it is inevitable. Uh, Pierre Schaffer was disappointed that people could still identify sound sources in his initial musique concrète experiments. Uh, despite Schaefer's rigorous theorizing, the human ear does have an uncanny ability to pick out recognizable sounds from a noisy environment, and it wasn't an, uh, until it became possible to granularize that sound with digital technology that sound fragments could really be distanced from their original source. As I mentioned earlier, the tape machine I started out with could only play back at 7.5 inches per second and Cage's score is explicitly for 15 inches per second. Uh, one inch of score on graph paper equals 1 15th of a second that way. Uh, to get around this, I determined that I could use an image processor to scale the um, score uh, in half on the horizontal axis. The ratio of splice angles would still be maintained and it worked out great. I did later get a tape machine that could do 15 inches per second, but by then I was already well into the work, so I just continued. How accurate is this? Uh, is it a cheat? It's debatable. Uh, my machines definitely have as good or better fidelity as the machines the Barons used. Um, I'm also using more modern tape stock, which has better response characteristics. So the change in speed really made minimal difference to the audio quality. It did, however, have the added bonus that um, I was working with one half as much total footage of tape. Uh, for instance, a six inch cut on the original score equals three inches. So I, did, I had to wrangle a lot less tape all said and done. Um, something to think about if you plan on doing your own tape version of this piece, and I recommend anyone who is interested that you definitely should try. I did also uh, goof up a few times. Uh, there's at least one passage where I accidentally spliced the same page twice in a row, 
and, and just forgot an entire page. Um, if someone wants to find that passage by comparing the score to my individual tracks, it would uh, stand out pretty clearly, but it really didn't bother me. I also I might have used some of the wrong sounds in the wrong places, but again, I wasn't bothered enough to hunt them down and take them out of the final tapes. Uh, for my versions, I've released the individual channels separately uh, as mono pairs, as a stereo mixdown uh, for convenience, as a binaural version for headphones, and as an ambisonics version for speaker domes. The piece was intended to be played back on eight devices with eight speakers, but that's obviously a lot to ask. But uh, Cage did leave it very open. There's no directions included with the score. Um, with modern devices like Bluetooth speakers getting cheaper and cheaper, it really it opens up a lot of creative ideas for playing back the piece. Uh, Cage wasn't concerned with sync or the listening environment, so just keep that in mind and don't worry about it too much. Cage wrote Williams Mix in 1952, the same year as 4 minutes 33 seconds, his, uh, I guess you could say infamous, silent piece. He said that both had a similar goal of making an environment that encouraged listening, but perhaps approached from different angles. In 4 minutes and 33 seconds, there never really is silence. If you just sit and listen, your focus is going to naturally go to the environment you're in. And in Williams Mix, he used his chance to remove composer intent and create a pure sound environment that inundates the listener. There's no imposed taste, uh, no imposed meaning. Silence is music, music is noise, noise is music. Anything can be art, and the corollary, nothing is art. He tried to push envelopes and ended up pushing people's buttons. I'm not a musicologist or art historian, so I won't go uh, too much more into it. Suffice to say, I think that some people take Cage way too seriously, and some people are too quick to dismiss him. I'm not even really a fan of Cage's music, which I realize is kind of insane to say since I spent so much time doing this piece he wrote, um, but I do think his ideas are interesting, and for me personally, my interest is really in early electronic music, and this piece is usually reckoned to be one of the first tape music pieces done in America, although the Barons had also done pieces like Heavenly Menagerie as early as 1950, but uh, either way, I thought it was odd that such a culturally significant piece with such a detailed and complete score uh, just hadn't been realized for tape again, as Cage I certainly wished it to be. Why has no one else done this piece for tape in the last 70 years? Well, it was never published, it's as simple as that. The score at the New York Public Library is a handwritten document made in 1952, and it's on the kind of graph paper you would find at an elementary school in the 50s. It's, it's definitely not acid-free. Uh, I'm confident that the New York Public Library is storing it and handling it in an archival manner. It's part of their John Cage manus uh, music manuscript collection, but it's not like each year it's going to get in better shape. It's a decaying document on newsprint paper quality. Um, editions Peter uh, Peters publishes the works of Cage, but I guess they balked at a 192-page uh, plus score printed in color. It seems like requesting a PDF for the New York City Public Library is really the only way forward for people who want to make a realization of this piece. Interest in tape music has also waned. I was going to say that tape music was only in vogue for a few years, but realistically, it was never meaningfully in vogue. The number of tape pieces that made a lasting impression can probably be counted on one hand, and uh, Delia Dervisher's theme for Doctor Who um, has to be the most heard one. The zeitgeist for academic electronic music quickly moved into computers. Um, I will say that this sort of collage of sound really found its home in filmmaking and sound designers like Walter Murch and Ben Burt. Like a billion people have heard their work on movies like Star Wars, so in that respect, tape music definitely lived on, it was just married to the motion picture. This piece also it just takes a huge amount of manual labor. Uh, it's the kind of thing that digital audio does make much more convenient, but also it doesn't really have the same character. Tape is more inconvenient to use, but the sound quality is still sought after. A quick survey of tape plugins for digital audio workstations shows an astounding number are out there. People obviously want tape character without the physical hassle. Now you may have heard me say um, at the beginning of this video that my 2023 version of Williams Mix is the first time the piece has been produced for tape in 70 years since the original, and that is true, but Williams Mix has been uh, re-envisioned several times since then, using the more convenient computer technologies that sprang up in the preceding decades, uh, most notably by Professor Tom Irby of uh, UCSD. Uh, he analyzed the original and wrote a program for pure data that interprets the graphic score and pulls sounds from a pool of samples provided by a wide array of guest artists. Theoretically, this pure data patch uh, could be fed from any number of sample pools to create a new version of Williams Mix ad infinitum, 
We actually exchanged some resources, so I'd like to thank him personally. Irby's also the author of a program called SoundHack that's a really awesome suite of tools for mutating sounds, and I've been using it in my personal music since the late 90s. I actually processed some of the sounds for this piece using a 1990s Macintosh running sound hack and another great program called TurboSynth. I think there's a lot of unexplored areas around combining these 90s like digital sound processing tools and mid-century tape music techniques, and going forward I'll definitely be looking into those areas. I've been releasing music for about 25 years now and have been interested in tape music since I was a kid. The college near me had a copy of Terrence Dwyer's tape music book and that really made an impression. When the internet came along, it became easier to track down the minuscule amount of tape music that made it onto record or CD reissue, and also to obtain secondhand gear like reel-to-reel -reel machines. But the idea of doing a mid-century style tape music uh, has always been on the back burner for me. I collected some reel-to-reel -reel machines and sporadically fooled around with tape loops over the years. Then in 2020, the lockdown happened and we all had a lot of time on our hands. The idea to do Williams Mix was appealing because I finally had time and I also wanted to get my hands dirty and practice splicing to really build that skill for my own work. Every year, the weight of previously released media grows. Marketing noise increases, um, subcultures get plundered in their fetal state before they can really blossom in the underground. For me, this piece is like media epic hack, uh, puking back up news, records, ads, social media, the environment we live in. Instead of making sense of the senseless, we can also choose to do the opposite, strip away meaning to make the meaningless. All of these things that I'm doing, like my music, are done with chance operations. Instead of making choices, I ask a question, and then I use the I Ching. I use that to answer the questions. The implication is that um, every answer is good. Thanks for joining me on this video and sticking with it to the end. This project was made possible with a cultural grant from the City of Austin with the assistance of Laura Kuhn from the John Cage Trust and the John Cage Music Manuscript Librarians at the New York Public Library. Thank you. I'm releasing my version of Williams Mix as an eight record box set, as well as digitally on all the standard platforms. Links are in the video description. I've also included links to further reading if you want to dive deeper into musique concrète and post-war electronic music. Peace.